What's up everyone, Steven here with Neural DSP on a new episode of Inside the Machine Podcast. Today, I got to talk to Dave Otero. He's a producer, recording, mixing, and mastering engineer, and has a studio near Denver, Colorado he's based out of called Flatline Audio. You'll know his work from such bands as Archspire, Cephalic Carnage, Chemist, and Cattle Decapitation. Our conversation ranged pretty widely from wrapping up the new Cattle Decapitation album, to the importance of routine, to his side interest in brewing his own beer. And I really enjoyed our time, and I hope that you enjoyed this conversation that I had with Dave Otero. So I'll probably have got done an introduction for you, but if you could give me a brief description of your, of your journey and history like with audio work, that would be, that'd be great. Yeah, for sure. Um, started uh, pr- when I was in high school, kind of messing around with this stuff. Uh, it was just in the earliest days of really being able to possible being possible to do any work on a computer. So I was actually tracking into ADATs uh, when I first started, uh, and uh, well, I'd say when I first started, I was tracking on a four track. And then I had my uh, four track. I, f- I finally I bought like a used mixing board at a music store for a couple hundred bucks, and you know, put my four tracks into that mixing board. <laughs> I had like sixteen channels that were unused, but yeah. Um, and then moved from a ADAT, uh, from that to ADATs, and was recording my own bands, and then started you know other bands just w- w- would ask about it, and I it just kind of fell into being a career. But I was a uh, a bit of a conscious thing like i did i do actually have a moment like as probably like a senior in high school or i was sitting there messing around with this four track and i was like I, I should do this for a job and then from that point on uh, just just what i've been doing and it's like magically worked out i think it's I had an easier time with that than uh, most for some reason so got it got it so you were the uh you were the drummer in your band right uh originally yeah like i i've kind of been everything i played drums in my first bands that was my original instrument um but then like my main what i would consider metal band um i was a guitar player and singer and songwriter and that sort of stuff so i've kind of done all the roles i've never played bass in a band mm-hmm. although i'd love to i really like playing bass i play bass on a on an album or two i believe just studio wise right 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 that's awesome so you've never technically worked like a, a real job then, right? Like you haven't done any retail work. You haven't done any of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I was like a, a bus boy when I was in <laughs> high school for a while. Right. Yeah. Right. Bus and tables at an out, an outback steakhouse. Uh huh. Um, I did that. I used to ride my, uh, I had like a little tiny motorcycle back in the day and I, that I'd like get off of school and ride my motorcycle to my bus job. Um, but it's just part time, and yeah, I've never, I haven't really had a lot of other work experience. Never worked in an office, never done a real to- retail thing, never like worked at a coffee shop. Just been doing this. I mean, it was like, I was like seventeen or eighteen when I started like charging bands, like a pretty paltry amount at first, mm-hmm. um, but a, a good amount for me, you know. So I didn't have too many bills back then, um, and then kind of got you know mostly off of my own band's recordings which i could put the most time into obviously kind of um grab the attention of uh, some of the bands in town that were doing things like fall carnage was one of the first ones okay uh and then was doing probably my first like label project a real label project um, besides my own band was uh looser interval for cephalic and i think i was like 19 or 20 or something when i did that one hmm that's cool that's really cool so you've you've been in You've been you've been in the business for for a while. Yeah, uh, a really long time, like twenty years or something like that. It doesn't seem like that, but I've been doing this f- like essentially full time for like twenty years, which is pretty crazy. Right, 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 right. That's awesome. So, uh, could you walk us through the recent cattle decapitation record you just finished working on? Like, uh, what did you do to prepare for it, and what are some things that a band like Cattle Decapitation do that makes the process or life easier for you? Um, I wouldn't say there's much they do that make life easier for me. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, they send me demos and stuff like that, but they're an old school band. You know, they write songs in a room together. So I'm not getting like, you know, they don't, none of them really have a lot of like DW experience or any. Um, so the demos I'm getting are, um, jam space, you know, zoom recording, um, demos and then sometimes they will have vocals laid over it but that's literally like 
Travis using the onboard mic on his iMac, like lounging in a in a you know chair doing like absolutely scratch stuff. So we it takes some time. Like there are no tempos. We figure out all the tempos when they get here. You know that there's no clicks until we set them up. Um. So as far as preparation ahead of time, um, more of that is like logistics stuff with them. Honestly, you know now they've got members in you know two different states in the u.s and and their bass player is canadian now so that presents a challenge so i have to kind of coordinate with their management and label to make sure travel schedules are accounted for not everyone comes and stays for the entire project um you know and uh, getting all the in from canada takes a little bit extra work as far as far as work visas and securing that sort of stuff so that's like an an added thing you know when um when bands have members kind of spread out and you've got management and labels and stuff like that to deal with. As far as music, I, I kind of have the opinion that I don't really want to dig into demos too much until I'm in a position where I can actually affect real change. So I like for bands to send me demos. I like to check them out um, once or twice. And I like the fact that if I have them send me demos, it kind of keeps them on the ball. So it's good for them. Um, but I'm going to only kind of briefly go over them until we're in here and we're ready to go. Because when I feel that inspiration, like that, for me, that only hits the first couple times I hear a song. You know, I, that's not true, but uh, it's different. It changes. You know, the more familiar be you become with a song or a track or a band, um, different things, you know, bring uh, come to the surface. So. I like to wait until everyone's here before I really start digging in. So, like, when they get here the day before, I'll start jamming those demos and headphones at the gym and stuff like that in the morning. And then when we're doing, you know, click tracks and tempo traps is when, really when I try and dig in. Especially um, with the demos, like, they send me that are just rehearsal space recordings. Like, things aren't super clear. Um you know, they're just writing these songs, so they're not played super tight. You know, they haven't really had a, like a, an album reference to practice based off of as far as tempos and stuff like that. So sometimes you're kind of like, is that is that supposed to be like that? Did someone fuck up? Um, right, right. Uh, so preparation wise, you know, it's not a lot, honestly. Right. I'm not a very good preparer anyway. I don't know if you realize that. Like, I, I read your questions like yesterday or something. I'm just kidding. I, I read them before, <laughs> but I didn't take any notes on them. So we'll see how this goes. That's uh, all right. That's all right. Um, yeah. I kind of just like a get in there and do it and see what happens. And uh, I've been luckily, lucky enough that that works well for me most, most of the time. But um, so preparation aside, um, when they get here, you know, this album in particular, we had a long time, two months, two full months, including mix. But um, it's, you know, laying down clicks. Tempos are per really important, you know, so everyone's in here. We're doing scratch guitars and click tracks. Drums aren't set up yet. This is the first cattle album that we've tracked drums at a different spot, not my own spot. So we took, I think, a day and a half, maybe two full days um, to go through and get scratch tracks and tempo tracks, um, tweak arrangements here and there. Some of that happened when we were laying out tempo. Some of that happened when we were doing drums. And then we even were, you know, you're continuously adjusting parts. I think we were even cutting sections and adjusting arrests and things like that, like all the way up until like the mix essentially. Right. Um, but yeah, then, then we track drums at the other spot, which is a bit of a debacle now. You know, I, t I take gear down there, so that eats up some time and there's some extra setup involved, but pays pays off, I think, having a big room, which I've never really had access to. Right. And then at that point, it's like, you know, you're just kind of getting into the nitty gritty of just getting tracks down. Like after drums are done, like some things are changing, but guitars and bass, um, it's a lot of just like, like you know, put your nose down or work kind of stuff. It's just getting takes out. It takes a while um, just to get perfect takes, essentially. Sure, sure. Um, but the whole while, we're kind of pre-proing stuff, and we were doing some, Travis and I were talking about vocal ideas, um, you know, as we're doing guitar stuff, and everything's continually getting adjusted. Every day or two, I'll put up bounces, and everyone listens to them, and we'll have comments here and there. You know, it's a lot. Of, it's just, in cattle, everyone's pretty involved. Um at least, uh, at least, like, 
the original, you know, brain trust, like of the of the three older members, uh, the newer guys maybe a little bit less so, but that'll uh, that'll change, I'm sure, as their you know time in the band becomes extended. Got it. Um, so it's like everyone has ideas on 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 everyone's parts. It's not so much like, okay, you do your thing, I'll do my thing. You know, every, everyone's kind of involved on all of it. So mm -hmm. a lot of opinions. And and which is a, a, both a good thing and can be a, f a f frustrating thing, or maybe maybe frustrating is the wrong word, but can can be a time consuming thing. You know, got a lot it. Of cooks, but, got it. Um, with them in particular, it all those cooks make a tasty meal. Sure, sure. Well, it seems like the same yeah. uh, same kind of ideas with like uh, Archspire. Like I, I listened to the podcast that you did on the ORM with uh, the guitar player from mm -hmm. Archspire. That was really cool. Um, yeah also another band that does all their writing in the same room which was interesting because uh, you have so many it people it, doing like guitar pro and like just writing all these like yeah. riffs and shit like that yeah. so it's it's fascinating that is that that is kind of cool that they all work in the same room they're a bit different in the fact that um they're just younger dudes and more technologically adapt i guess <laughs> like i mean that's just like that seems to be the line i'm not calling cattle old guys because i'm i'm their age you know but um but the older bands just grew up doing everything in the same room and they don't really pre-pro demos out where arch buyer is kind of like the odd man out in their scene as far as like writing in the same room but they do they come to me with like fully produced demos and um, all of them are pretty, I mean, at least many of them are pretty comfortable in a computer recording environment. Dean in particular is extremely comfortable. So while we're over here doing uh, bass tracks or I'm working on drum edits or something like that, he's back in the uh, band apartment, you know, the guest house, um, pre-proing vocals. And, they're, and, they're, and I, have like, I have like very complete demos like stemmed out. So... They come with tempos already. We may change them, but we have a lot of that technical data to begin with. Um, where in cattle, we just have raw songs that only exist like in a couple of crappy, uh, you know, practice space recordings and their heads, which is they they pre present different opportunities, you know. And and the, my workflow as a producer changes a little bit because essentially for me, I need to be pretty well aware of everything going on to make informed decisions like a across the board you know so right i kind of need to have an idea of what the vocals are going to be like when we're tracking drums um to do the best job that i can and at that with cattle that just requires a little more investigation and we still may we still may not have um you know any vocal takes recorded even scratch takes but i'm kind of like peering through travis's eyes into his brain and playing around in there and and just trying to pull it out and then we you know we've all done a good amount of albums now so we kind of have a little bit of that unspoken communication thing going on which which uh, is helpful especially in situations like that right right do you find that that's something that's problematic for like newer bands uh as far as like ne technological advancements and like do you think that people are using that so much as like a crutch or is that like something that's helping certain bands or and not others you know, I don't, I don't really think it's either or. It's just a different way of doing things. Right. It seems to be more the norm now, and there's a lot of elements of that that I like. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I prefer to have, you know, yeah, send me click tracks to all your songs, you know, um, and that way we can work off of that. It does. It can lead to a little more of like, you know, people call demoitis as as far as a little more resistance, um, because they've already done like. Maybe they've already lab labored over like okay, um, one ninety six or one ninety eight for this part, you know. And if I have an opinion, like th they've already spent an hour arguing uh, over that at some point, you know. So I have a little bit of you know, if, if I'm trying to get them to move in one direction uh, versus another, I may have to push a little harder or make my case a little stronger. Mm -hmm. um, but but I do. I mean, I, I think it does just make bands come in more prepared. Um, it's cool to have, you know, if I can avoid doing scratch guitars uh, for a whole album, that really, it saves a day. You maybe lose some magic moments that would happen during that process. So, I mean, all of it's kind of a give and take, I guess, you know. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. Um, do you think that it's, uh, 
I mean, do you find yourself moving more towards the digital as well? Like, cause I know, I know you just recently got, uh, I think you put it up on your YouTube page. Uh, I think it was like an EQ or a compressor. I can't remember which, but like, do you find yourself moving more and more in the box than out? I am, I've always been in the box, like 100% of the box until very recently. And I'm just starting to experiment with, with that in the other direction. Um, and there are some things that I like about it and I'm trying to, I'm still kind of figuring out exactly like what where my comfort level is going to be um, because I'm very comfortable with like a fully in the box workflow. And, and there are a lot of benefits to that. You know, I mean, there are a lot of dudes who, who have, you know, like legendary mixers who've been out of the box forever and, and they don't, and they're like, oh, I'm just tired of dealing with recalls and patch bays and cables going out. And, um, you know, I, I really do think that depending on your skill level, you can get just about any sound you want in either environment. Right. Um, but for me, I kind of just needed something to like spice it up a little bit, you know? Uh, and it was just kind of somewhere for me to go to keep my interest on the gear side and, uh, to keep my intrigue and in audio in general. Like I said, I've been doing it for 20 years. So rather than, um, fall into just, uh, like a groove of comfort where I'm not trying to really push myself at all. And, um, I just felt like mixing it up, I guess. But I'm still, I mean, even continually adjusting that, you know, like I picked up uh, uh, sh uh, late last year, I picked up an SSL Sigma with the idea of like going to this, uh, you know, outboard summing workflow. And uh, whether it made a difference in my mixes is debatable. It was fun for a while, but the workflow just got to be too debilitating. Right. Um, uh, at least with what I was used to and how I was running it. So I haven't used it in four months. I think I run some like inserts through it or something like that, but it's really not doing anything and probably right. going to end up on uh, reverb.com pretty soon here. <laughs> Trade it out for something <laughs> new, you know? No, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the it feels like with the way that uh, technology and society is now, is like you have to put out content so much quicker than you used to. Like, like my workflow, mm -hmm. I have to, you know, put out two videos a week. So I have to have like my session templates set up and ready to go. I'm writing two, yep. maybe three minute long tracks a week. So that way I could just pump out yep. like, you know, tutorials and videos and stuff like that. So like I pull up the same session every time and I have the same plugins. Maybe yep. I do like a little tweaking here or there per sure. project, but like you want to tweak them. Yeah. To keep things moving along a little yeah. bit, you know, yeah. but yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. 100%. Exactly. Um, the flips the flip side of that it's not always just about working faster it's about like um, maintaining that creative vibe you know so like like yeah getting work done fast is great and that definitely is the way the world has gone especially with like um, you know YouTube creators or content creators like yourself I'm I guess I would fall under that um, category as well but but albums are different you know there's not as much of a it's not as much of the rinse and repeat as you might have to do, you know, cramming out two videos a week kind of thing. But if I feel inspired to do something and I can, you know, get to the creative part in 20 seconds instead of two minutes, that's a big difference to yes. me. You know, especially when there's the, like a bunch of small things happening throughout a day. And, um, so, excuse me, some of the tools that, that I was, I'm using a lot uh, these days in Cubase, like render in place and things that allow me to tweak things really fast, uh, we're just becoming more difficult uh, in a in at least the outboard summing workflow that I had set up, and it just was becoming not worth it. Right. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. No. Time. Time is money, and you want to be able to try and retain as much of that as you yeah. as you possibly can. So, what advice would you give to a smart driven producers or musicians about to enter like the real world like what advice should they ignore as well as things they should learn uh i don't know Hard, it's that's a difficult answer uh that's a difficult question to answer without being too derivative i mean there mm -hmm. are this there are the stock answers right which i will say um which is you know don't get hung up on gear uh, uh try and work with bands especially good bands like you will learn more from good bands than you were than you will from bad bands 100 mm -hmm. um uh you know use 
use stock plugins instead of dumping all your money and do other plugins. Uh, but that those are also the things that everyone's going to ignore, as I did. You know, like the toys are kind of what what makes some of this part fun. Like the yes. gear is cool, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but but yeah, focus on focus on the creative part. Focus on your output. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what that's what matters. That's where you'll make your name is by making things that sound good. Right. Uh, you know, there's kind of two sides of that coin. You, you have to constantly have good output and then, um, you know, maintain a reputation for being someone that, who's, who's like good to work with. If you're recording bands, that's even more important. Right. And your relationship with labels, like deliver on time, deliver organized files, organization is one thing <laughs> that professionals will appreciate more than anything else. Yes. So, spell things properly you know when you're submitting files um just like file organization in general i've i've gotten a lot of that's like the first thing that people say when i work with a new label they're like oh man you've got a lot of compliments on how organized your your you know master delivery was and i was like well what about that way the album sounded man they're like oh yeah that's great too but your files are so organized and that's honestly like the people that you're dealing with they probably value that higher because they're just trying to get through their day right and they don't want to have to send 10 emails to clarify uh you know hey what's this what's this what's this deliver what you're supposed to when you say you're going to do it um you know and if, if you have to deviate from that and it's going to benefit the album then you know explain the situation and nine times out of ten right uh, right you know, everyone's in this for the music, so you have to do what's best for that. But, but yeah, I mean, uh, just put your nose down and work, man. You know, it, like a lot of things have changed, honestly, since I was in that position. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I and I never really thought about it too much. I just thought recording bands was cool. It got a couple of decent opportunities, and then sort of discovered that I, I was pretty good at guiding musicians and realizing their visions and, uh, you know, managing time well with a bunch of people, um, managing communication pretty well. Like those are, that's half the battle right there. Obviously you got to be able to like, uh, you know, provide good mixes and stuff like that, but it's all the back end stuff that will really pay dividends in the long run. Right. Right. What's one of the best or most worthwhile investments you've ever made? Could be investment in time, energy, money, Etc. Uh, this is probably one of those questions that I should have uh, like prepared an answer for. <laughs> um, I mean, it could be something as abstract as like you know your education or you know a book that you that you that you've enjoyed or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's tricky just to nail it down to one thing. I mean, I don't I don't really think the world works that way. You know, I could give you like one plugin that I really like, uh, but what value is that actually going to provide to someone? Not a lot, you know, it works well for me, may not work well for them. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think, um, this is going to be a weird answer. It's not going to really translate to anyone else, but, okay. uh, I, I am fucking lazy. And what I, what I mean by that is that I only want to do what I want to do. Okay, and that's like a, a mindset that that gave me troubles uh, throughout my entire life, but has enabled me to f- like make this little pocket in the world for myself right now. So I couldn't, I can't work for someone else. Um, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it, kind of thing, you know. I'll, of course, like I'm also an adult, and you <laughs> have to live in the real world. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but I, I think that attitude has has it kind of forced me to, you know realize this um career as something that is sustainable Mm -hmm. so uh i i worked hard enough at it because that's because i wanted it to work so i wouldn't have to you know like uh be a slave to the man i guess um Mm -hmm. so i don't really know i don't know if that's a an experience or a thing it's just like part of my personality that I think has helped help drive this. I like I, I was lucky enough to have at least a tiny bit of, of talent to like back up my choices. But uh but yeah I was I was just so I I just found myself in a situation where I couldn't imagine having a nine to five or doing something where I wasn't kind of like running the ship or at least in control of my own destiny. Right. And I, I think that forced my hand and like, well, this better work out. 
And if it ever doesn't one day, I'm totally fucked. I'll, I'll be like calling you. I'll be like, hey, man, can I vacuum your spot on the weekends? You need any help editing podcasts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, I, I, I have actually, no other skills. I, I think that that resonates. I mean, I, I know that resonates with me because I actually said something yeah. incredibly similar to somebody just like three days ago. Um, I was, I was mm-hmm. being interviewed on another podcast and I was like, I'm... I'm super lazy. I am so absolutely lazy that I want to ensure that I work the smartest and not the hardest ways possible. Yeah. And that's a matter of like yeah. positioning. Like it's like, okay, well I don't feel like going to the gym in the morning. So I'm going to make sure that yeah. I can set up my clothes and my shoes. So that way I can just put it mm-hmm. on and get out. So I don't have to think about it. I don't yeah. have to, you know, do any sort of registering whatsoever. So like it's choosing those things that I'm being lazy about. So that way I can get to my ultimate goal of like you, it's like yeah. I can be working for myself. Like I get to make my own hours to come in here Mm-hmm. I get to choose the curriculum that I I, I film and it's mm-hmm. it's awesome, but I'm super lazy about a lot of a lot of simple things. But you know, it's just a matter of prioritizing. Well, it's just like, yeah, I mean that the fact that you know you've made this opportunity for yourself, um, you, you better make sure that content's good and you better put in the time to to uh, to ensure that there aren't any issues and that you you keep this position that you found yourself in. You know, so that's kind of where where I am and it, lazy. Probably not like the best word for either of our situations. It, it sounds it's kind of funny. That's why I said it. But it's like <laughs> I I can't actively allocate my willpower. It's yeah. just there for certain things and not for other things. Yes. Like the video stuff that I've kind of been getting into recently um, was something that I've kind of had interested in uh, interest in for a while. And when I finally decided to just like okay, let's go in, let's spend some money on some some pretty basic camera gear and some lighting and stuff like that. Uh, and then I just like fell into this world of nonstop learning. And that's kind of just like ha- how I've ended up in these spots where I, I was just like, you know, 24 hours a day when I wasn't at the studio actually working on an album. I was reading stuff about video production and lighting and the technical aspects and um, trying to figure out a workflow for creating these videos for myself. And it, it encompassed my life, you know, to the point where. In a few months, I, I, I got okay at it. You know, I can produce like decently looking video content. I'm still working on the content part itself. That's a little trickier. There's not, um, you know, that's not something you can learn from a YouTube tutorial quite as easily. So, a little more exploratory in that sense. But uh, it's it's like, you know, obviously, I was putting tons of work into that, but it was something that that um, I found passion in, and I think that's just like my brain is limited to expending resources on those things that I find passionate in, I guess. And I can't, I'm not able to force it for other things. Right. Tried my entire life uh, and it was a struggle and, you know, uh, school and stuff like that and, and uh, subjects I wasn't interested in. So yep. I'm not anxious to, uh, to, to return to that, like having to force yourself to expend energy on things where, where there's just no, there's just nothing happening and there's no, there's no drive. There's no passions. I want. So before I uh, before I started working in audio, I was at a guitar shop and educating myself on how to become a CPA. So I was going to be doing mm-hmm. taxes, and I was actually uh, working with a CPA doing some doing some returns. And it was like on a Sunday, and I'm like inputting numbers, and I, I just realized I'm like I would be absolutely miserable doing this for the rest of my life. I, I can't. I, I yeah. just cannot do that to myself because I will not do yeah. anybody justice. I won't save anybody any money. I won't. I will, I will do the yeah. bare minimum possible. So I would rather do something that I'm actually passionate about because, you know, I, I, th- I thought for a long time that I didn't like I didn't like education. It's like, no, I, I'm, mm-hmm. I love education, but it's, it has to be a subject that I'm interested in. Otherwise I'm going to get way yep. bored and I'm not going to, I'm not going to yep. give it its due, due diligence. Um, so that was like yep. a big thing when going into the audio world, it's like, this is something that I really, really want. And it's a matter of like parsing out, like how I'm going to attack it in the best way possible. Yeah, no, that I'm, I'm totally feel the same way about all that. Um, and I guess uh, I was lucky enough. I think both of us were probably lucky enough to kind of like f- find that little pocket in something that we had some talent in, you know. So it's working out so far. Yeah. Um, 
and I would just that's that's like maybe okay maybe we just uh, distilled this little <laughs> advice uh, chapter down to to what we're actually what I'm trying to say here. Yes, which is you know find something you're passionate about yep. and that you're good at. You know, and I've hope I hope for your sake that those are you know whoever I'm speaking to. I hope for your sake that those align because um, mm-hmm. that'll make for a happy life. Um, and if they don't, it might make for a not happy life. <laughs> Like, so what are some yeah. recommendations that you'd have for like the guitar players wanting to either get together in a band or have their band succeed, like, you know, get their name out there maybe, or, you know, things that you see, things that you see musicians doing wrong that if you could tell them like in a couple of sentences, like what should they do to do better? Um, <clears throat> What should they do to do better? Yeah. Uh, I like, like. What do you see Archspire do to succeed that other people aren't doing? You, you know, it's it, it's tricky, honestly, because a lot of the truly successful bands, it's a strange combination of intangibles by happenstance. Like, right. I, I hate to say that 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 that's like it's all, it's not always something you can craft. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's kind of like wow. Um, all of the most successful bands that I work with, just about each person in the band has something that I that I am just like I find remarkable about them, mm-hmm. you know, or at least a few of them have a lot of that. They they just they either have more drive than others, or they have a different way of thinking about the world and music than others, or th- they have something that makes them stand apart, and that that's that's like the common denominator for these really successful bands is like a difference uh, from the rest of humanity, I guess, you know, (laughs) like in some small way. Right. Uh, And it just allows them to stand out really is what it is, you know? And it, and it's like, it's really hard when you're just being bombarded with so much music and um, uh, everything. So there's so much art coming at you all the time to, to create something that's not just like purely derivative, even if it's derivative of like four or five sources, like, yeah, you can slap that together and that's, that's cool. But if it doesn't have something that you can call unique, it's going to be really difficult for that to make, um, you know, a, a stamp on the world, I guess. Right, right. There's just too much music out there. And there's a lot of guys that are doing like the tried and too, true stuff just so well. You're just never going to be able to compete. You know, they know exactly what that formula is and they can just pump out tune after tune after tune after tune. Right. And you really need, you really need something, whether it's, um, part of your playing or part of your songwriting or just how you approach the aesthetic or the lyrics of the band. You just need to have something that you can kind of find your own pocket with. That's good. You know, I mean, that's like the goal for every producer and musician is to find something that's new and good that's extremely difficult right because there's just so many people pumping out content and music these days to to find a little niche that you can say this is mine no one else even if they tried they couldn't really do it this same way right is um that's what makes that's what makes bands into businesses you know to to kind of be uh, lame about it um but it that's that's what it takes to have a, a longevity in your career and to really make a, a your own little spot in the scene, I guess. So like band members are complementary to each other, and there's a vision and a forward thinking nature of like trying to set trends rather than follow them. Yeah, I mean, it, but I like it, like it, it's 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 kind of one of those things that's difficult to force as the train goes by. <laughs> um, uh, it's one of those things that's difficult to force. So that's why, like, I feel like a lot of this advice I'm giving people is like, well, hope you have this. If not, you're fucked. Um, but I, it's it's like, you know, most of the people and most of the bands that I've encountered that are successful, it's it's uh, innate abilities and in people that that not so much like, hey, we had this idea of, you know, we wanted to be this unique band and then we made it happen, like. It's usually not possible, you know. Right. Music comes from, just comes out of you in most cases. So sure, sure. But I mean, uh, some other th- some other things that are beneficial is like division of labor, I guess, or responsibilities. You know, it's it's a good idea to to kind of split up responsibilities within a band and and uh, suit the strong suits of those individuals. One person's really good at you know getting back to people uh, via emails right away, and then 
by all means, like have him the one, you know, that's in charge of those kind of communications rather than the guy who's going to take two weeks to do it. Yep. If, um, one guy ha- really has a lot of a technical technical ability, really loves gear, really loves like signal flow. Mm-hmm. Cool, have him figure out your in ears, you know, if you're doing that and, you know, your your stage set up and, you know, incorporate lights and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, you can definitely, outside of, you know, just writing and playing, a lot of other responsibilities in a band. Um, and, you know, if you're at the level where management isn't really a part of the equation, um, then, you know, dividing those responsibilities up in a smart manner would probably behoove you. <laughs> sure, sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, you know, speaking of division of labor, like, so what, so you have an assistant that does like edits and uh, uh, prepping and stuff like that for you? Like, how do I you... I don't, um, but I, so I've, I've kind of gone back and forth. I actually have, um, strangely enough, just... Uh, started exploring that again now, as far as session prep and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, I've had uh, I've had people in the past that I've sent edits to, and a few different times. And I've had I had a local guy for a while that could come in and run sessions for me if I needed to, or if a band had like a constricted budget, he could handle part of the project and I could handle part of the project, that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but none of those have been very long standing, and I'm just exploring that option again. I've I'm doing, I've got a lot of mixes coming up and it kind of like, I was getting so tired of setting them up, you know, doing my, doing like my drums to MIDI workflow and organizing all the files and gain staging. It was, it's, it was going back to that thing where it's really difficult for me to force willpower on things I don't want to do. I was like dreading and I was honestly like falling behind on projects just because I was like, I was working so slow through that part or I was like, ah, I'll just work on this other thing. I'll, I'll set up this project for mix tomorrow, <laughs> you know, just putting it off. And I was like, you know what, man, this is killing me. Yeah. You know, and especially if, if you're mixing a project, it's, it goes back to that, um, not wanting to hear demos until I was in a point where I could have, aff- could affect change. You know, it's, it's a similar kind of thing, like spending a day or a day and a half just setting up a project uh, and the dread that fills me, you know, with even having to think about that, like, I don't want to start a mix on, on that sour note. Right. So, uh, so I definitely think it's a smart thing. I have, I also have like a bit of trouble re- relinquishing power, you know, or a creative control over anything I'm involved with. I'm a, I'm a bit of like, I'll just take on everything and then I'll overload myself. Uh, so that was something I had to get, I had to get past even with edits, like like I was saying, I used to send out drum edits all the time. And then, I mean, I had like some of the top dudes doing them for me and I would get back excellent results, but one or two things wouldn't be how I would do it. Right. So then I'm like, okay, I have to do drum edits again myself. And it's, it's such a time sink, you know, so that's just finding that balance. You know, like I did all the drum edits from, for the Archspire album. I did all the drum edits for the Cattle album that we just did this last time. And it's like, I'm happy with how they sound. They're exactly as I want them to be. But, you know, for Cattle Album, that was like four days or something. Like, it was an insane amount of time, you know, just because that's insane music. Yes. And I've got these guys in town, you know, so it's just four days that they're just sitting on their ass, like doing nothing. Yep. And then, you know, when it comes time to get back into it, they're all like, they're so like wound up that I'm, you know, I have to like, kind of like cull that energy. But I, I understand it at the same time. So, right. Yeah, I'm still trying to find that balance. You know, 20 years into this, it's it's a difficult thing for me um, between maintaining control, creative control, and trying to smartly use you know my own mental resources. You mm-hmm. know, so things like uh, um, project setup, th- there's not a whole lot of creativity in that. Honestly, it's it's a lot of like technical stuff. So I'm I'm 100 going to start. Um, pushing that off onto an assistant and kind of in the, in the process of, of doing that now. And then I may start kind of reintroducing some of that editing help, you know, it's just, just got to try and I wish I could just like clone my brain and enslave a version of myself in a dark room, <laughs> uh, slide food under the door and just like edit these drums, yep. edit these drums, Dave too. Um, <laughs> Maybe, maybe one day. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's you know, we'll get to the point where we can clone consciousness into a computer at some point, you know, and then mm-hmm. that, that'll that be it. Everything's going to be automated. It's going to be wonderful. 
yeah. <laughs> that's cool. So how how do you handle your schedule? Do you have like how like how minute are you as far as like the day to day like routine wise like going to the gym or whatever like how uh how do you handle that that section uh you know i i'm i struggle well i strive for as much consistency as possible um so like typically that would mean trying to get up at the same time um hit the gym in the morning that's part of my workflow or at least most of the days um come back get some coffee in me, get to work, get going, you know, and try and keep that, try and stay motivated on stuff. Mm -hmm. But man, that, that stuff for me just goes up and down all the time. It's, it's a struggle. I also have a daughter, so I have to work that schedule in. So like summertime schedules differently than school time schedule. Um, and then like th things like illness will just like throw such a wrench in the works, you know, like I was like crushing my daily workflow for the first month of the cattle album. And then I just got brutally sick. Like, I got such a crappy cold, and there's no days off. You know, I've got five guys, like like I mentioned before, dudes from different countries here doing nothing but working on this album. I can't take, I can't take days off, like, other than, like, the scheduled ones we had already planned for. You know, we, we have to stay on schedule. I've got people away from their lives and families, um, and the, the stakes are too great, you know. So, like, you just have to work through that stuff, which kind of, like, extends that you know if you can't rest then you're just going to feel bad for longer and then that throws off um you know thing like my things like my gym schedule which i find pretty important at least as far as like feeling good mm -hmm. so it, it uh as soon as like one thing comes in there and and wrecks that it's a struggle to get back. i mean i'm still like that was like two months ago at this point and between that and summer vacations uh it's i'm struggling to like get back into my groove and I don't quite feel right until I'm, until I'm back in that groove. So, right. I, I, I find it important and I strive, uh, you know, to, to keep that, uh, that constant schedule, you know, consistent, um, mm -hmm. but it doesn't always happen. So when did you start implementing that kind of schedule? Um, like I, I, I find that I found that once I, really started understanding how that tied into my health and my mental well-being like i really mm -hmm. started getting very serious about that like maybe about 10 years ago so that was like 20 years of my life where i'm like just yeah. do, do, do i don't know why i feel like shit but you know i do so i guess that's just how it yeah. is like yeah and that and like, honestly the older you get the more important that stuff becomes honestly because you don't have as much of that like uh, youthful vigor that just like pours out of uh, every orifice, you know, then you can just do whatever <laughs> the fuck you want and you're invincible. I mean, that's, that shit's awesome when you're like a teenager. Um, but that it slowly starts to go away. You have to like ma actively maintain it, you mm -hmm. know? So mm -hmm. for me, it was kind of an accident, you know, it's when it's pretty much when my daughter was born and I realized that like, okay, well I have to prioritize like time for this now instead of just working all the time you know every studio guy starts off working weekends because that's when local bands want to record um and then at some point i was like well i i don't want to have opposite schedules of everyone else that i like you know interact with and my, my other family members and stuff like that so i s started kind of like like well no actually studio hours are this you know Monday through Friday essentially like for local bands I don't work on the weekends when I have band in town I, I have to kind of split that balance you know because of the aforementioned issues with people you know being in town and trying to respect their time away from their families as well you can make some compromises there sure but if I'm working with local bands I, I take weekends off because I have other parts of my life and if I'm trying to do this until I retire you know I have to like maintain those relationships outside the studio and also maintain my own sanity you know and have balance in my life i i am i have a lot of hobbies and i have a lot of other interests like audio was one of those you know that i dove into and it happened to be aligned with you know a point in my life where i i needed some direction for my future so that's where i poured my energy in but i i probably could have just as easily you know found myself doing a few different things, you know, like probably all similar kind of things, you know, there was like, like I've been way into photography at points. I'm kind of into the video thing now. Um, 
I used to train, um, you know, mixed martial arts like six days a week, like hours a day. There was one point where I thought I was going to try and be a professional fighter. You know, there was another point where I got so like hardcore into brewing beer that I had like rooms full of equipment and I was spending like 20 hours a week brewing like four different batches of all grain <laughs> beer. And I, at that point, had I not already had a career, I 100% could have opened a brewery and I, probably done pretty well at it you know because when i i just i'll find these pockets and just like dive into them so fucking deep <laughs> that that uh it's like encompassing you know so and audio is like the one reoccurring one mm -hmm. and it's like sometimes i'll have to actively be like okay dave i know you really like this hobby you found now but this doesn't pay your bills you have to re you have to like come out of this hole that you're in right now and like you know, uh, reinvigorate your passion for um, music and production because that is your you know lifetime career. Uh, I know I find my way back there, but it it will get so bad that I'll kind of like forget and I'll just be so deep in this new hobby thing. So, mm -hmm. so I I have to I have to save time for that. You know, right. um, I have to I have to make time to at least allow my brain to like explore new things because it's just like part of what makes me happy, I guess. So no, absolutely. I mean, like having that it, like. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, it's like, it's like my life is just a, a combination of hobbies. I'm lucky enough to kind of do one of them, um, for a job, you know, which is, which is awesome. Like I, I constantly remind myself how lucky I am to have that. I mean, I, I like talk to most other people in the world don't have that luxury. You know, mm -hmm. they have their day job that they hate and then they have their, what, what's the, the term that I, uh, heard recently you have your nine to five and you have your five to nine you know so that's that time in the evening where you do what you really want to do right 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 and people who are yeah people who are lucky enough to turn their five to nine into their nine to five and be successful at it it's a, a rare thing and should be um cherished i suppose or at least appreciated oh well, it makes a lot of sense um and speaking of the uh five to nine to nine to five like what what are some things you think people should kind of keep in mind if they wanted to make that overlap from their like hobby into the professional world, like that, you know, it's like, I found, I find that a lot of people lack patience when it comes to that. Like my transition over, over to audio was, was relatively quick, but it still mm -hmm. was like, at least like it, it, it was a while before I made any money doing what I'm doing. And yeah. I was, I was, I was lucky and, and really, you know, really grateful that, you know, my parents were, were kind enough to let me move back in while I was making that transition. And they were super understanding mm -hmm. of me wanting to pursue audio rather than doing anything else. Um, so they let yeah. me stay there, but it's like, I had to work just that much harder because, you know, I could like visually see my, my savings just dwindling as, as the months yeah. went by. Yeah. I, I was lucky enough to kind of like get my footing in this world when I still had those, you know, financial securities of, of living with parents and stuff like that. So that, that would, is absolutely <clears throat> a struggle for those who don't have that available, you know, um, some financial support th through that transition. Cause it's not going to happen right away. Like, I'm not sure with the responsibilities that I have now, if I could, if I could make such a, a shift, you know, I guess I'm older now and I do have some savings and I've built up some financial stability. Mm -hmm. So at this point in my life, I maybe could, but at the, at the point where maybe a lot of people are like, maybe they're in college and you know, th they thought they wanted to go down this one career path and they're not enjoying it. But well, you know, they have like, you know, student loans to deal with and they're already responsible for paying rent on a place. Like, it's going to be a tough switch. Like, I, like I, I, I don't know what advice I'd have for you other than, you know, if, if that's something that you 100% want to go down, first, like, be sure of yourself. And then, two, like, reach out and, and see what solutions you have as far as, like, providing yourself with some financial stability. I mean, that's like, you got to live in this world, you know, that takes money. That's like, I can imagine that being one of the, the main, you know, roadblocks um, to making a transition from a more traditional career path that you just find yourself being not, uh, you know, 
really into. Like, honestly, my my girlfriend's kind of in a similar spot right now with, like, she, she's in a career path that she enjoys, but, but um, maybe not com- completely in love with her current position. And it's about she she's got plenty of drive, but it's like her her current job just drains so much of her energy and takes so much of her time that, you know, she's struggling between um, working on things, you know, in that five to nine window um, or do you just suck it up and essentially throw yourself to the wolves and hope you can run fast enough, you know, like Mm -hmm. that's the other option. Right. Um, But but, you know, I, I would be hesitant to give. Um, someone that I don't know that from that advice because you could end up being eaten by those wolves. <laughs> that's 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 <laughs> so true. Um, so 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 the, the, one of the big pushes for me to get into audio full time was I actually lost my job. Like the the store mm-hmm. that I was working at closed down, um, mm-hmm. and you know it was like I have X amount of money in my savings account, so I might as well just like just try it. And just go for it as much as I can, yeah, but like for sure, I, and and people see that as like a success story, and 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 yeah, I'm, it it, it could have easily broken the other way. It you know I'm I'm yeah. fully aware of that, uh, and what what I tell people is that yeah, I had a two year plan before the shop closed though, like I had written mm-hmm. out like my financial and monetary goals for moving into audio, and it was going to take me at least two years to move into that. Because I knew it wasn't going to make me money right away, but I positioned yeah. myself well enough that I'm, you know, and I'm and I'm lucky enough, and people like me well enough that I got enough money to survive. And now I'm in a position where you know I'm working for Neural DSP, and it's you know I'm I'm in a great position. Mm-hmm. You know, I moved moved yeah. from Sacramento, California to Los Angeles, which is like a six hour drive, I think. And you know, so yeah. now I'm I'm doing the thing that I love because I put the time into it. Uh, but it's not the path that I would recommend to everybody. Like that's, that's what yeah, I tell people. Yeah. It's like, I, I broke lucky, but it doesn't always happen that way. It doesn't yeah. always. Yeah. And like you know, a lot of, uh, you know, you definitely make your own destiny to a certain extent by, um, by having those skills that, you know, can attract business and make want make people want to continue working with you. Mm-hmm. Um, but but it, there's a certain amount of luck and timing involved when it, and that's just difficult to control. And it's way easier when you're younger. Like I remember, well, like I started playing guitar a little bit later than um, some people. You know, I played drums as my main instrument for a long time, and I remember even thinking when I was like still like you know my early twenties, like man, I wish I started playing guitar when I was twelve. And I see all these kids and they don't have these responsibilities. They can just practice guitar six hours a day. I'm never gonna be able to play these Ingve solos that these kids can play now. <laughs> you know, and it and it's because and I was only twenty, but I just still had too many responsibilities at that point, you know, day to day stuff that I couldn't put eight hours I couldn't put that amount of focus into one thing. You know, I'd already had kind of like made my bed in other areas of my life. So mm-hmm. um yeah, I mean it's just allocation of your own resources, you know. But but you gotta you gotta balance the you know responsibilities of being a member of a society that revolves around currency, you know, which is like some some amount of your you know attention has to be spent on you know maintaining a roof over your head and paying for food and stuff like that. So until you can align those, um, you just gotta be careful, you know. But but I it's like. I don't, know. I don't know where to, where to put that balance. You know, I don't want to scare people away from it. it. Depends on your temperament, and if you see an opportunity, like yourself, like it, like you, you know, some of that decision was made for you, losing your job, and that um, can provide a spark. Um, but yeah, you got to you got to like balance those balance those two things out. It's a difficult thing. It's different for everyone, I guess. Yeah, no, it it definitely is. You know, and it it depends on positioning, depends on location, like. There's a reason why I moved to LA when I'm living in Sacramento because Sacramento's music scene is not where I needed to be. You know, like the engineers up there yeah. are already established, and you know, it's like all my metal mm-hmm. metal band friends would like they had their guy that they go to, and he's like cornered like the niche up there. So it's like, okay, well, I might as well just try and position myself in the best way possible so I can get the business I'm looking yeah. for. You know, and yeah, not only that, but also being willing to to pivot in my goals as well because you know when i first started out it's like okay my goal was i want to 
I want to record bands. I want to mix. I want to master. I want to work with metal bands, et cetera, et cetera. And then I, uh, you know, I, I, I'm now, I'm now find myself doing wholly, you know, video production, you know, and I didn't expect yeah. that when I, when I got into it, I, I was very, very much, uh, surprised at the direction I had to go in. Yeah. But, you know, at the same time, you know, it's like I knew that if I had stuck to my original plan, I wouldn't be where I'm at now. Yeah. And things could also always change for you. You know, if, if you, if you, you know, make, making connections in this industry will, uh, will possibly open the opportunities to go, to go back to more music production stuff if you wanted to in the future, really, you know, so it's like, it's like you, you saw a window, um, and you went for it and, and now you're there. Now, you, now that window's yours. It's gone for somebody else, you know, so you control that little spot right now and, and you can kind of decide where, where that takes you in the future. You know, I kind of, I was lucky enough that when I was starting my studio, there wasn't really another established like metal dude, you know, they were just going to studios that had house engineers and all getting utterly shit returns out of it. You know, the only um, successful bands in town were having to leave state to, to record really there just wasn't another uh, another option at least that i didn't feel that i could like outperform like pretty much immediately you know so right right now uh with with uh you know now it's a little more like i kind of got to look over my shoulder a little more now because uh with availability of tools like urm and just the knowledge being so much more available and the entrance fee uh with you know like being able to use like moderately spec computers and um free to evaluate software um <laughs> it's a little shout out to john there uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh the, you know that uh that that just m means that the entrance fee to get into this industry is like way smaller than it has been in the past you know so um at this point i'm i'm pretty good and and i'm happy to see guys uh, local guys doing a good job because my uh client pool um majority of it probably it comes from you know not the local scene I, or maybe half and half i mean i still work with a lot of local bands that i love right um but uh, i'm not as reliant on it anymore so uh being a being a pretty competitive person in the past when i when i hear a mix from a guy in town i'm like shit you motherfucker uh uh you know now <laughs> i now i'm a little more happy for him uh because because there's room there's room for a few different people here that are all doing good work you know so yeah yeah absolutely so you 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 mentioned you're kind of like a competitive person and um do you uh -huh. find that that's the reason why you're getting so much more into like video and stuff like that to to elevate yourself in as far as like visibility and stuff like that um or is that just a fun no, thing that you've I don't... wanted to do it's kind of it's kind of a fun thing. I've always actually had had interest in that. You know, I was I, I've had uh, periods where I've been really into photography, uh, but the gear that I had at the time was like the level of DSLR. Like right before video was really a viable thing with them. Like they recorded video, but like any kind of autofocus was super primitive and terrible, and there wasn't any. I didn't have any like f flat color profiles available. You know, like. So I wasn't ever ever really able to do it. Like my phone would literally take better video than you know the Nikon DSLR I had at the time. Um, and the URM experience kind of like showed me that I sort of enjoyed the video creation or at least the teaching aspect of it. Right. I also saw a bit of the value that having some sort of like forward facing internet presence could have for a producer in this age. Like you know like these roles have typically been behind the scenes, you know, and they have been for the first 19 years of me doing this. Um, but just the way the world is now, like you kind of got to spread yourself out there a little bit and maybe pr provide um, some forward facing content as, you know, like, like a, a producer rather than like that, all, all, just being the band's responsibility. Um, and then it would just seem kind of fun, you know, and it was just, it was just like kind of fell into that hobby thing of like, oh, this is a new thing I can learn and like dive, you know, deep dive into for a while, which is just kind of fun. Like learning, especially when you're like into it and you have that passion, it's just really fun to learn a new skill. Right. And, and, you know, one that would coincide with the, with the studio rather than some of my other hobbies, which are like completely separate, you know? So it's like, this is something I can get into. And it could also have, you know, some benefit to my work life. Um, 
So, I mean, it was just a combination of all those things. And I was like, ah, why not? And I, yeah. and I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it. If I'm going to spend money on it and I'm going to spend studio money on it, then I've got to make it pay off, you know? So right. that motivated, once I, once I bought the stuff, that motivated me and like, well, I got to make something now. And then I kind of just like dove into it, you know, and, and the, let's be honest, the bar on YouTube's not real high. So it almost <laughs> like, <laughs> it I mean, almost makes it a little bit it, easier. So, uh, just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are, there's a lot of really impressive stuff. Oh, there's absolutely. a lot of extremely impressive stuff, but there's also like tons of just crap, you it's know, garbage, yeah. whether it's yeah. crap. Yeah, pra- crap production quality or just crap advice, you know, crap opinions. Um, so I was like, well, you know, I do this stuff um, for a living. I could, I could feel, I could offer what I feel is like some pretty good opinions and pretty good advice on stuff from someone who's actively doing it. And there's, uh, there's some of those guys, you know, out there, but not all of them for sure. Right. So it's like, yeah, let's just give it a shot. And, it, you know, it's just kind of fun. I have since realized how much goddamn work it is. And every time I'm like, yeah, I'm going to start a new video. And then like four hours into it, I'm like, motherfucker, <laughs> why did I do this? I'm already like way too busy with just normal work. Yeah. And I'm just like recording for eight to 10 hours and I go home and like edit, you know, like I, I'm, I don't know if it's that I'm just not very fast at this or I haven't like ironed out my workflow, but an editing like a 15 minute video takes me six to eight hours, you Ooh. know? between grading and laying in B-roll and mm-hmm. figuring out exactly, you know, how I want it to be laid out. And I'm trying not to just, like, yell at a camera and then just, like, put it up there without any kind of thought or entertainment value, you know? Right. Because there, there, there needs to be an entertainment aspect to it, you know? Yes. Like, it should look cool. It should be kind of – it should have some kind of funny parts, you know? It's like – it's hard to do. It's hard to blend all that stuff, you yes. know. So, it's not. I'm not fast at it. At least not yet. I'm sure I'll get better. Right. And I, like right. I'm a kind of a crappy presenter. I realize so I spend so <laughs> much time editing out ums and <laughs> and and the you know like all these like words that just like make me sound like a buffoon. Uh, uh, so, yes. Yes. I, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, dude, believe I, so me. I, like, I, I, all all my videos are that. all jump cuts between like I just do like single yeah. sentences and then just like give myself markers uh, where I did a good job and then just cut everything mm-hmm. else in between. There's there's yeah. long long stretches of just mumbling and and make up made up noises. Practicing you know? <laughs> your lines. Yeah. 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 It's it's tricky, man. I try and I try and to keep it pretty natural and conversational too, because I think there's there's value in just to like not having everything so scripted and planned, you know. Yep. Um, but then I'll just talk myself into a corner, or uh, you know, I'll. Uh, not really complete a, a thought fully, or I don't cover exactly what I wanted to, and then I'm kind of stuck with trying to make it work. It's it's tricky. I'm I'm still figuring that part out. Yeah. Plus, there's that whole thing where I'm not very good at preparing, so i like <laughs> I'm forcing myself. I'm forcing myself to make outlines. Like my first one or two videos, I was like, cool, set up a camera and just start talking, you know, and they they worked out okay. But um, it was like kind of a struggle to put together a cohesive you know, video, um, perform, not performance, but, um, presentation mm-hmm. afterwards where I'm trying to, I'm trying to kind of ensure that from the get go now. So I'm writing outlines and I'll script small parts just to kind of get me going, but I'm still trying to leave a lot of it kind of free flowing, I suppose. So it's a, it's a new thing. It's a new challenge and it's like, it's it had some overlap, um, but, but not a whole lot. So it's, it's, you know, my expertise in the field, I guess I can rely on uh, in what I'm presenting. But as far as being able to to do that efficiently and in a uh, entertaining manner, it's not as easy as you might think. Now I, I have uh, more respect for some of the content that I see on the the web now because I'm like, man, that's so well organized and put together, and I understand the the time that probably took n- not only in filming and editing but in planning and scripting. You know. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I mean, like, and, and there's such a, there seems to be such a market with education right now too. Like there's like a, 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 a thirst for knowledge that I mm-hmm. maybe haven't noticed. Maybe, maybe I've only noticed because I've been also trying to educate myself as much as well. But, uh, uh, but that's been a thing that I've noticed on YouTube, especially where 
everybody wants to learn their their stuff and and like as you said like there's a lot of crap out there because you get people who yeah, have like yeah. you know they have a camera or they have a phone and they just set yeah. it up and they go yeah. this is how you play wonderwall and it, like it's like no yeah. bro no <laughs> no <laughs> just stop please <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, I mean, some of that stuff is will will you know be uh, weeded out by uh, you know essentially a, a free market of YouTube, but it's still out there to weed through at times, you know. So, but and then you know you also you don't want to just prioritize the proven creators and leave no room for for uh, newer creators to kind of come up and make a name for themselves. So it's uh, yeah, it's. It's YouTube. The, that whole ecosystem is incredible, though. Like I, I've always kind of had a DIY mentality, and it's just so much easier now. Like, you know, I learned most of my audio stuff. Um, um, that's not true. I'm learning new shit every day, honestly. But I got my footing in it at least before YouTube was a thing. But I work on all my own cars, and I like l I learned everything on YouTube, and you know, reading forums, and I, I, you know fix my washing machine when it breaks and shit like that on YouTube. And I, I like so many things. I just like, um, you're able to find some knowledge and you hope you find the right stuff, you know, and you're and probably everyone is just like, uh, f you know, using their little like bullshit sensors in their brain, you know, to discover, um, you know, what's good advice, what's bad advice. I feel like that's probably something that, that, uh, people are developing maybe more than they used to just because, there's less of a roadblock to, to get out there and offer, you know, advice to people. So right. it's kind of up to the, the person looking for that advice, like, okay, where, you know, where am I going to get it from? Make sure I'm not being led down the, the incorrect path. But it's amazing. It's just an amazing amount of knowledge. You yes. Know? Yeah. <laughs> and for video stuff, YouTube was also perfect because it's, it's lit, you know, it's like, the medium, the medium that you're trying to learn about is like what this entire ecosystem is based upon. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's some really cool stuff, and and all of like the the teachers in that field that have kind of gotten big now, like Peter McKinnon and uh, Maddie Hapoya and yes. Potato Jet. Some of those guys, like yep. those are some of my favorite channels now. You know, um, and and they've they've kind of bridged to this like vlog it's just cr it's crazy you know so they started off doing tutorials and now they're just like entertainment channels and it, they they have found that balance in there well like you're learning stuff but it's also fun to watch you know yep. uh and it's not just like a boring dude you know talking with one camera angle and a monotone voice with not a lot of other visual information coming at you know so so i've i tried to take some of that element and bring a bit of that into the audio stuff, which I'm definitely not very good at it yet, but working on it. No, no. I mean, I, I've, I've really been impressed with the quality of your videos. Like I've, 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 I've been watching and they all look really great. Cool. I think, I, I th I think <laughs> Thanks, they flow man. really, <laughs> really well. And I think they look fantastic. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'm trying like the, the technical stuff is easier for me because that's something you can just, you can learn, you can study, you can practice, you can learn. Uh, presenting is more of like, it's like, you know, it's more of a skill and a talent that you can have or can't have. And I, I think I have like a little bit of, a little bit of something there that I can build upon as far as being an entertainer, entertaining person to, you know, to watch present something. Sure. But it's definitely requires practice, you know. So it's, it's, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's struggle for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that was like, uh, you know, just starting working with Nero DSP, it was like kind of just like okay, just out of the out of the frying pan into the fire. All right, let's let's see what I could do. Yeah, you know, and and they liked yeah. they liked what I did, thankfully. And you know, it's like now I'm I've gotten into a much better flow nowadays, and and people are enjoying the content, yeah. which is great. You know, it's 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 very it's very encouraging. Yeah. You know, it's for especially for somebody yeah. who's just starting out, essentially, uh, with like the video stuff. I almost like, yeah, and and I I I. I'm a bit jealous in a way because I because I do want to improve the video thing so much. I almost wish that I could just like switch and do this as my job for six months because you learn so much faster if you can just apply that much time into one skill. You know, mm -hmm. where for me, I'm having to find time after you know the stuff that's paying the bills. Um, so it's been a bit frustrating. There have there have been elements of this workflow that have been frustrating because. It's close enough to a DAW that uh, 
I want to be extremely proficient in it, like immediately. Like it, like in, in Cubase, I can do anything I want. I know 10 ways to accomplish any task, and I know the exact like benefits of doing it every different way, and I and immediately know exactly what I want to do to get to my endpoint, where I'm still like, I'll have an idea in my head. I'm like, well... I maybe know one way to get there. It's probably not the most efficient. You know, there's whole aspects of the software that I haven't even dug into yet. Mm -hmm. But I'm just I'm I'm so used to being, you know, proficient in a DAW that uh, not having that proficiency in a nonlinear video editor is frustrating at times. Like especially at first, I was like, oh, I don't know how to do anything. I hate this. <laughs> <laughs> it was taking me so long, and I'm like, I didn't, I hadn't figured out the key commands, or I didn't even really know like a good editing workflow. And that, and honestly, some of the real knowledge is what's trickier to find on YouTube. Like, sure, okay, you can find a bajillion color grading tutorials or camera setting tutorials, but like, hey, what's an efficient workflow? What's a good organizational strategy mm -hmm. to produce YouTube content from start to finish? Like, nobody's making videos on that because, I, I mean, maybe there, maybe the thirst isn't there for that yet, you know? So there's definitely, a, there's holes. Like, the thing with the YouTube knowledge, if you're trying to learn an, uh, an entire skill, a, a well-rounded skill, you're going to have to fill some of those holes you right. know, yourself. Right. You're going to have to you know, learn what you can from these little bite-sized tutorials. And then I was able to find a few like long-form things. Like I just need to watch some guy edit something start to finish. Like yeah. I don't want a, a, a quick t a top 10 tips to make you edit faster in Premiere Pro. <laughs> like, I, like I've watched enough of those. <laughs> I need to watch a professional work yeah. like all the way. Well, because you, know? you start found, getting like the overlap, yeah. Yeah, it's just oh, it's just like oh, cool, key, oh, key command here or like, uh, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. It's just like bite-sized bits, and what, but what I, what I needed was some of the glue to hold them all together, and like real workflow shit, like nail the mix stuff. Yes, you know, like yes, like you know, like okay, you watch it all. So even the things that this guy that's presenting doesn't think are important, maybe that's what you need. Maybe that's where the holes in your knowledge are. You know, so so that's. And I'm still like trying to find that stuff. I kind of, I think I have a pretty good editing workflow now, but now I'm like, okay, what's the best way to organize, a, you know, your shoot? Like, um, so I would love to be in the fly in the wall for, for some of these guys, you know, to, to do a whole shoot. I'm, I'm sure there are courses that exist, you know, but I, I still don't have quite the time to dedicate into a full course. So it's like, it's a give and take there, obviously. But, right, right. But yeah, as far as like, planning and uh you know sh making shot lists like i would love to to, to be able to to pre-plan some of that stuff and have a shot list and know exactly what i'm going to do you know you watch like behind the scenes of the last scene of game of thrones i don't know if you watched any of that uh, documentary they did or do you watch game of thrones i do yeah 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 and then like that that documentary they released like the week after the final episode you know shows some of the directors like literally sketching out every single shot ahead of time every single shot mm -hmm. like that kind of foresight like i feel like i i can kind of look into the future on an album now you know because i've been doing it for long enough but that kind of uh, foresight in a video production would be incredible like to just like look and like be able to essentially watch an entire production in my brain and then work backwards and build those pieces and, and efficiently do them one at a time, you know? Mm -hmm. I still sort of feel like I kind of go in there and, like, wildly just, like, film shit and then put it together later. And hopefully <laughs> it makes sense, you know? Yeah. And it and it's it it's, it does work out okay, but it would be a lot better, right? If I could if I could lay it all out and like really have like just like a complete, you know. But having to get a video done in a few days, you know, that's just not really a possibility. So right, finding right. some combination of those workflows yeah. would be cool. No, I think I think that's uh, like sort of the the strength of having the script beforehand. So like I, I generally will script out my videos beforehand. Like I'm doing a yeah. I'm doing a video coming up about how to use your neural DSP plugins live. So like have your laptop, have your yep. interface, plug that into a cabinet, etc. And like yep. 
I have like these ideas for shots because like I'm going through and I'm scripting out like these are the things you need, you know, this, that, the other, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like planning on doing some like yeah. Edgar Wright snap zooms on like different mater- like pieces and whatever. Yeah. So it's like it sort of for comes sure, with sure. like the the, the uh, composition at the very beginning. Um, but it's it's yeah, definitely like, like I am. it's it's a very personal workflow something you kind of have to figure out Mm -hmm. for yourself which is like frustrating in a way because like when you're already in the thick of it or you already have like a full-time job it's like how do i spend the time developing that yeah Yeah. but even if i could like have a you know see a few other people's workflows and then kind of base base mine upon that like Mm -hmm. honestly when we're done with this podcast i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, pick your pick your brain about (laughs) your workflow (laughs) absolutely yeah yeah (laughs) Uh, yeah, because you know, do you do you do you write a script first, and then you get your A roll, and then you and then you make notes where you get B roll parts? Do you film the A roll first, and then go back and do B roll? Are you editing as you're filming, or do you try and film everything first and edit later? But then maybe your lights have been torn down, so it's going to be tough to go back and add any. Uh, you know, like there's just a lot of shit to. Uh, you know, and when I'm trying to work this stuff around actual working sessions, you know, I can't yeah. leave like a, a tripod in the middle of my room when I've got, you know, when I have to record guitars the next day or something like that. Yeah. You know? So it's like, and I'm always just kind of like, ah, shit, let me just get this done real fast. And, and, uh, with not enough, um, you know, planning goes into it. So yeah, I'm still absolutely. working on it. But, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, it is fun. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, it is a lot of fun. Switching gears, we might do a couple of like, you know, just quick fire questions, you know, and then kind of wrap up the que- sure. the podcast. Uh, cause I want to be mindful cool. of your time. Of course we've gone for, I think about an hour. Um, but, uh, desert Island plugin or piece of gear. So like, what do, what do you find yourself bringing to every mix session or every, every recording session? I mean, pro pro Q three, you know, currently would be my absolutely most used plugin on any session. Now it's like, 95% of my EQs. Um, but new ones that I've uh, really found a really cool use for would be uh, Golfoss. I did a video on that, and I still find it like to be an amazing thing that does something that that <clears throat> is unattainable any other way. Mm-hmm. I've actually had a couple other engineers, like, uh, you know, dudes doing stuff. Uh, uh, one of them just a few days ago hit me up and was like, man, I watched your video. And I bought it on the spot and it's been on uh, like all of my mixes, you know, and this is a guy putting up like he's a professional, you know, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, that's rad. That's, it was cool for me to hear from like, another like dude who's actually doing this as a living, you know, that he got something out of it. Um, another one that is kind of pricey, which sucks, but I do find it's provided me something new is that uh, sugar plugin from Process Audio Sugar. Okay. Which is pretty cool. It does sort of a similar thing to Gulfoss in that it's like there's some magic shit going on, but it it's a little more controllable and it does it more with like adding um, like harmonic content to okay. areas of a bus. It's kind of a CPU hog. Mm-hmm. Um, honestly, workflow stuff like uh, uh, not only because this is the neural podcast, but those are really like some of the first uh, plugins that are allowing me to use like. Uh, uh, sim plugins like in a mix you know right. like honestly all of the all of the solos and some of the clean guitars on the new cattle album are neural dsp awesome. and i've almost i almost i've almost never left those in the mix i mean i've been using sims forever for scratch guitars and stuff like that mm-hmm. but there's always been a roadblock for me as far as like it being like quality enough to like make it into the mix and like uh, it's it's getting better across the board but the, some of the neural stuff, um, specifically like parallax, is just incredible. Like on bass, it's been a little bit ahead of the curve. Uh, if, for whatever reason, the bass sims I think have been more mix ready than the guitar sims for the last few years. But parallax, I think I've used on. I, I couldn't quite fit into the cattle album because I kind of already had my sound set. But everything right. I've done since then, um, parallax has been on on them. Um, right. And then that. Uh, plenty is it plenty or plenty plenty Pl- plenty i i plenty I, yeah is, I, I, I had uh, that i had that same same question when i first heard of it i was like yeah <laughs> plenty, plenty, plenty? okay yeah plenty yeah uh, but yeah that that plugin is amazing clean tones are incredible and like the reverb with i forgot the term they use for it, but it's like a, the pitched reverb it has like that higher octave that <laughs> blends in and gives you that ethereal sound yeah that hasn't really that's like a that's 
there's been so many physical guitar pedals that do that really cool thing yeah that hasn't really been an option in the box unless you create it and it's a pain in the ass and you got to bust it out and then pitch shift it and then put a reverb on it and trying to get it to blend in where it just sounds just right right and having that available in a mix i haven't done it yet but i am absolutely going to try and use that uh that reverb pedal as just an effects end just for the reverb you know on vocals or on a, a synth pad or something like that as soon as i get the opportunity because it sounds incredible yeah that sounds amazing Let's see. Uh, what uh, What is a band that you think deserves attention that isn't getting it, or think deserves more attention than they're getting? Um, let's see. I would say a Legion, a band that I work with, but they're actually, I think they're finally getting the attention they deserve. They seem to they seem to kind of just get shit on by the industry for the first couple albums. <laughs> it it just they were putting in the work and they had the songs, and it just took them a little bit longer to like get where they needed to go um there are definitely some other bands there is um a band i work with actors from la called tetrarch that i'm that we're getting ready to do another album with and i've worked with them a few times and the last album it's something a little bit out of my wheelhouse it's more of like a a radio ready rock uh, almost new metal thing but they will have really heavy parts too almost gojira-esque or slipknot-esque and there's some songs that are just like really good. They really put it all together. They work extremely hard. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like they're they're probably at a point where something will break pretty well for them right now. I mean, they're already actually getting pretty big opportunities. They played the like uh, what I think it's called like Epicenter Fest or something like that. Really big fest on the East Coast pretty recently. They've done some tours. They've, they're getting some pretty good press. Um, but I feel like. With one more really solid output from them, which we're going to get, you know, uh, later this year, then I I feel like they're a band that could make maybe, maybe jump to the next level, and they have some of those unique intangibles about them as well as well that could that could give them a lasting career. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the ones. I'm sure there's like a bajillion others that that are just not coming to my brain right now, but. Yeah, that's what jumps to the forefront. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, if you could choose one band to book in your studio right now, who would it be? Um, I've, I've had a short list of bands, um, like this for a while, you know, obviously like the big hitters, like who wouldn't want to record a Judas Priest album, but at the same time, like the, the one that Andy Sneap just did was just like so perfect. So that's, that's the give and take there. It's like, usually when I like a band, the production is going to be a big part of that because that's a large part of music to me. So, um, I would love to work with them, but I also really like the output they have with, you know, their their current situation so that'd be one um immolation was always like a death metal band that i liked a whole lot in the past but even they've kind of found a team now that's doing a pretty good job Mm -hmm. it's tricky man i I get asked that question all the time and never really have a solid answer you know my favorite bands i guess but at the same time like i I almost want to preserve that like fan relationship i have with that music um because it changes you know once you once you work on it so no that that makes a lot of sense you know your business relationships should you know, be separate from your friendships and your other relationships. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's no. kind of, it's sort of just nice to like have like an out, like just retain a few of those purely fan kind of relationships with some of your favorites, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Well, awesome. I think that's, uh, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up and thank you so much for your time and, and being willing to come on to the podcast yeah. and talk with me. For sure, man. I'm, it was a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me and, uh, can't wait to, uh, re-watch all of myself talking for an hour (laughs) sounds awesome awesome very cool cool thank you so much for checking out this video i hope that you enjoyed this conversation i had please like share and subscribe and hit the bell icon for notifications leave your comment down below and let me know who you would like me to interview next as always i'll see you in that next video